Все едно съм казал шега и всички се смеят точно. Okay, so okay, hi everyone, officially. Uh, welcome to Beer JS, uh, June 21, 20, 2021 edition. Uh, today I'm going to talk about technical interviewing. So this is actually a very non-technical presentation. I recently, kind of almost a year ago now, became a, an engineering manager. So I don't feel confident talking about code anymore. I don't understand anything. I'm just a manager. Uh, so yeah, okay. Uh, so, okay, that's the internet not cooperating. Okay, here we go. Uh, searching for a new job, the only reason for a developer to ever shave, uh, as we know. So I guess you all, some of you are searching for jobs. That, that's good to hear. Uh, <laughs> well, you're getting something out of it. But this presentation and about me, I'm uh, Mishu, Mikhail, Michael, whatever. Uh, and I am currently an engineering manager at SumUp. I uh, enjoy a lot of sci-fi stuff. So I'm like a nerd. I'm a board game geek. I own like 200 board games at home play regularly and I like to juggle and do some other weird stuff. I've never watched a football match in like five years or ten years. So I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this talk is not about how to search for a job. It's not about how to attract candidates if you're a company, and it's definitely not about how not about how to negotiate your salary. This is a huge topic. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with your technical skills, so you have to maybe practice a little bit, like you know, playing some interesting auction games. Uh, so okay, so we're going to focus on the middle part of the interview process. So if the process starts with engagement, is the candidate interested, is the company interested, is there an organizational fit between the two, we move into screening, uh, and this should probably happen automatically as much as possible. Then we have the face-to-face -face interviews, which actually determine whether the candidate should uh, be offered a position, and then we move into the salary negotiation point. Um, so obviously there is no one specific way to structure this process, and it depends on many factors, including these I've listed, like company size, the maturity of the team, the time to market, and maybe the most important, the culture of the company. I mean, it depends on how big it is, how it's disposed towards people, whether it's who wants to hire junior people and grow them or hire senior people and, you know, think that they'll do something magical about stuff. Uh, yeah, and there are many types of interviews and these are the ones I'm gonna kind of talk about today. Uh, something we call system design, uh, then there's the type of depth of expertise, we have the coding interview, we have a bar raiser, and we have a wash up, and it's uh, with an asterisk because it's not technically an interview. So the candidate is not there. This happens at the end of the process uh, when everybody that's interviewed the candidate gathers and you know compares notes and talks about whether the candidate passed or not. And there are many ways to conduct each of these types of interviews. So you could give a candidate a test, you can have a whiteboard interview, you can do pair coding, uh, or you can give them a homework assignment. And we'll see how the types of interviews mix and match with the ways you can you know, uh, lead them. Uh, but whatever type of interview you're doing, and I don't know how many of, of the people in the room actually go either lead interviews or participate in, in the interview process in some form or fashion? Three people? Yeah, that's okay, okay. And you guys lead interviews or? Yeah, okay. I'm just like this. Nice. Okay, but you've all been to an interview, right? You've all been, at least I hope so, or you know, you came randomly. Uh, okay, whatever, all the interviews are about one thing, and that's evidence, right? Uh, <laughs> Evidence, meaning uh, things we, we are searching for signals or data points about the skills and abilities of the candidate. This can be about their technical uh, skills, their, their problem-solving abilities, 
the way they collaborate, the way they uh, prioritize and assess the complexity of the problem, how they structure their solution. These are all signals or data points that we can collect during an interview. And there are two types of evidence. Obviously, there's bad evidence and there's good evidence. And I've listed some examples here. So uh, at the end of the interview, if I say, I like how the candidate thinks, that's bullshit, that's meaningless, that's useless. Right, uh, the candidate has a good understanding of the subject. Thanks, uh, Dr. Obvious. Uh, the candidate solved the problem well. Um, what did he do specifically? Right. So the, the underlying qualifiers are not do not carry actual information. They don't tell you anything about what the candidate actually did. Right. So we want to write the evidence after we did do an interview or take notes during the interview in a way that allows us to capture the actual performance of the candidate during the interview. So we can say the candidate broke out, broke down the problem into X, Y, Z specific sub-problems. They suggested using a technology to solve that specific problem, right? Uh, they identified some additional concerns uh, proactively, and they explained clearly how a specific technology actually solves that specific sub-problem. Right? So we can write these things down and now we painted the picture so anybody coming in reading that kind of these notes can make an assessment mm, that that seems like a good a good thing, right? A good indication of ability. Uh, so good interviewers are like detectives. They are looking for evidence. And the corollary of that is that good uh, candidates are like sloppy criminals. They want to leave as much evidence as possible behind, right? They want to be uh, very kind of, if there were criminals, they want to, you know, leave their fingerprints all over the place. So, and a, a very important part is, is that as the interviewer, you're not actually, during the interview, you're not a judge. You're not trying to, if you put yourself in the mindset where you say, I'm here to make a Boolean decision, yes, no, uh, fail, pass, true, false, that prevents you from thinking about the evidence. That kind of narrows you down in that focus of, I'm here to make a yes, no decision, so I'll keep a single bit of state, and it's going to flip throughout the interview, right, like this, but then you, you actually don't have anything. Right? You just have that piece of state, which is useless without the journey of it getting there. So you're just collecting the evidence during the interview. And then at, at the end, during the wash up, you actually gather with everybody else who participated in the interview cycle. And here it's a good maybe place to say that uh, my experience <laughs> is that the more people, I mean, the more to a certain limit, obviously, that participate in, a, in an interview or a series of interviews with a candidate, the better. I mean, if you have just one person interviewing another person, they could as well just, you know, keep that Boolean measure, right? They don't need that much evidence. But usually you would have one, two, three people interviewing a candidate in different sessions using different <laughs> techniques, complementary, hopefully, so that at the end they would make the best decision possible about that candidate. Uh, and as the interviewer, you're actually responsible for enabling the candidate to present their best. It's, it's a popular trap for a young interviewers to go into an interview and say, oh, I have that very nasty problem that if I give it to them and they'll like start thinking in the wrong direction and I'll get them and they would fail, right? That, that's useless. That's not helping you assess whether the person is going to actually be a good part of your team, right? It, it's just stroking your ego, making you feel good about you knowing an obscure thing that they didn't know. Uh, and also the, the color is, uh, the, the other thing is true as well. Candidates are collecting information as well, right? If you are, uh, the, the way you treat them is speaking to the company's culture to them. They're assessing, the company through you you're the representative and you need to understand that if they have a bad experience they might go out and say oh that company is uh, awful they you know they made me you know they did a very bad interview with me and i had a, an awful experience and probably you know but sourcing candidates is actually very hard 
right? I mean, finding in Bulgaria, in the world, uh, we are, for good or for worse, we are a popular kind of breed. So we are sought after and, you know, finding the candidates is hard. And every interview is a two-way culture interview. So you're kind of in a position where you're exchanging culture between the candidate and the company. Okay, so the meat of the, of the presentation is some bad interview practices. And bad is with an asterisk again because these can be useful, but there are traps. There are problems that you can easily fall into when you're doing it. And that's also helpful for candidates when they see a problematic uh, behavior on the other end, they can try and get out of the vicious cycle. They can help the interviewer actually get evidence instead of failing in a specific way. So uh, the first one is what I call the password interview. And the, the idea of the password interview is that the interviewer is looking for a specific keyword or a specific technology to be mentioned, right? If I am like a big Java guy, you know, somebody comes in and they are like, you know, they programmed in uh, Erlang for like uh, 20 years. And I'm like, can you, how would you solve this? And I'm expecting to hear Java and they say like actor model Erlang. I'm like, no, this guy doesn't understand it. You know, he's not going to be able to solve it. Uh, and that's just, the, the idea is that uh, closed-ended close, close -ended questions, like, you know, questions, short questions that they're expecting, what would you use or, you know, uh, that expect specific type of answers, uh, don't allow the candidate, don't create the, the right atmosphere for discussion. Uh, and it can work but you have to be careful about your biases right if you're if you have some biases you have to make sure that you're not expecting a specific answer you are open and receptive to what the candidate is actually saying so that you can evaluate and help them elaborate and convince you right as as i mentioned before you are enabling the candidate to present their best so you're there not to say that's not it. You're there to say, okay, help me understand how that can work. Um, and that's not a cool interview, obviously. I'm saying the password interview, the magic trick interview, but these are just things that happen during an interview. Right? Uh, the magic trick uh, is a similar concept uh, where the candidate is expected to uh, solve a problem, a very obscure problem, in an optimal way. And we all know these. Let's say it's a very popular one. You have a, an array of numbers. All the numbers uh, appear twice. Only one number appears one time. How can you solve that? How can you find the unique number in an optimal way, right? Then usually that type of problem is very useless in a company setting, right? If you're, let's say, especially because it's a beer JS, right? Most people who write in JavaScript usually write some sort of front end or some sort of um, API driven backends where they consume some data, transform it, pass it, get some inputs, you know, do, do those kinds of things. They don't do uh, deep algorithmic problem solving in JavaScript, right? If you're doing that, Maybe you need to take a step back and reevaluate. Go on. Yeah, but uh, deep algorithmic uh, thinking might tell them maybe is data transformation better. Uh, sure, sure. But the point is, it can work as long as it's the basis of a future discussion. I have a personal experience with this, where when I was changing uh, jobs last time, I went to an interview for a company that was run by five PhD students uh, that were doing uh, some visualizations for genetic data and they manipulate kind of large amounts of genetic data and they visualize it. And they wanted somebody to build their Kubernetes infrastructure and to set the micro front end architecture. And I failed the interview because I didn't know how to solve a linear algebra problem. I mean, it wasn't even a programming problem. I solved it in uh, big O of uh, N square, right? But they said, there's a linear solution. And I said, sorry, guys, I, you know, I just can't figure it out right now in the 30 minutes I had. 
And they said, well, you're uh, pretty, and I had a, another interview that was a system design interview. And I passed that, but they said, well, we are looking for somebody that really knows the math to set up our like micro front end architecture. <laughs> so, you know, it just, I mean, you have to know how to use it. I'm not saying it never works, but what's the weight of that signal within your decision matrix, right? Mm -hmm. That's the important bit here. Uh, the paper coding interview. And with the paper coding interview, the problem again comes to context, right? If you are the candidates, as I, I, I imagine you as candidates have been in this situation where you go and you're saying, okay, write that, like, you know, write binary search on, on paper. That should be easy enough. Write binary search on paper in Erlang. Write binary search on paper in Erlang backwards, right? I mean, <laughs> like that's not the point of Japanese. Of the, Japanese. Uh, that's not the point of the exercise. That just creates undue stress. If you provide the candidate with, let's say, you say it's okay, it doesn't need to be syntactically correct. It could be just, you know, meta language. You know, I just want to see how you lay out the the program, right? That's fine. But if you're expecting them to have memorized the documentation and say, oh, think about it. How many, uh, what's the order of the uh, of the arguments to sub-CTR versus substring? I don't know. I don't remember. Each time I need to use these two functions in JavaScript uh, for string like uh, shortening, I have to look up which was the one that takes length and which was the one that takes two indices. Can't, can't seem to remember those. Uh, so I hope nobody was in that type of experience where, but it's very easy for uh, an interviewer to use that sort of trap to reject a candidate they have a personal bias against. And it could be even a, a, a unconscious bias, right? <laughs> it could be that the interviewer like, you know, saw them, they're a redhead or something, whatever, they have their own type of t-shirt, they like a hip hop t-shirt and you're like a metal guy. So, you, you know, there was like something that made you want to reject them on a subconscious level. And you can justify to yourself that you use like a, a little trap uh, that that candidate didn't pass. Like I come up without evidence with a binary yes, no at the end. That's it. They were garbage. Why were they garbage? Well, you should have seen them. Like they didn't even know like the 17th parameter to that function by heart. Um, okay, so the, the other one that I have mentioned here is the unpaid internship type of interview. And uh, the problem here is that the candidate is expected to commit an unreasonable amount of time uh, on, on from their own time, right? So that's very high opportunity cost. If I am uh, applying to four companies and all four companies expect me to spend a week of my time full time, you know, solving a problem or developing something for them, that's basically a month that I need to be working for free in order to to get a job. And you know that some can, some can candidates might do it, right? Some companies might expect it, but usually for me, that's the that's a sign that there might be a cultural problem in the company where people are habitually expect, expected to work overtime, or you know, they, there is no balance of uh, you know the, the joke about uh, we ask them for estimates and then treat them as deadlines, right? Uh, that's that's a very bad kind of idea here. Uh, so this type of thing, giving somebody homework, is very useful, but it should be definitely scoped, time boxed, and if not, it should be compensated. Right? You can go in, say, okay, we'll pay you, we'll basically hire you as an intern or like as a contractor for a week. You will not get like the maximum salary, but there should be some appreciation of the candidate's time, you know, because the OM will be the same if you take one or two months to interview them. Uh, why do you think that spending time on interviews should be compensated by the company? Well, if I interview and they spend but two or that's, three hours with you, uh, should it both be compensated to make it? That's mutual. <clears throat> Here I'm talking about uh, a, a take-home type of assignment, right? 
where I you you send me a PDF with some like you know with an, uh, with a thing that I you know I can I should develop at home and the thing is so big and I should deploy it like in production and it should look beautiful it should like be microservice architecture it should have like all of these things that take time and effort to build, which is going to first be thrown away because it's not a production actual for actual issue that you're solving for the company. You're solving a baby problem, but you're using a bazooka to do it. And then you're asked to do a, a lot of work, you know, for free base. So during an interview, one, two, three, four hours, that's perfectly normal for both parties to agree to to spend together, and that's a mutual investment. But when the investment is, I, I send you a document and I can send it to a thousand people, and yeah, all of them. It's, it's written by itself. It's written by some guy that maybe spent a week or a month or two to make the document yeah. be great. Sure, but they, but he was compensated during that time. Right, somebody paid him to do that document. Yeah. Some the, the the document is going to be sent out to a bunch of people, and the cost of that document is going to get you know uh, amortized over the period of time, over the period of people. Well, it should be updated. You know, you can also just say you get you know, 2001 and Sure, of <laughs> course, but again, I mean, it's it's again it's. Maybe we have a culture of difference, and that's yeah, okay. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> a bit because it's it's again, if you're sending somebody a homework assignment and it's like you can do it reasonably well in a day or two, that's fine. You okay. don't need to compensate them. But if you're expecting them to do unreasonable time, right, to invest unreasonable time and effort, and that's where it's fuzzy, right? It's never like you know just black and white. It's about Asking the candidate maybe, hey, are you comfortable? Does that seem like a reasonable amount of work, right? And I, for example, have received assignments and I look at them and I'm like, which of these do you want me to do, right? Like, what should I focus on? What's the thing that you actually want to see, right? And then we have a conversation about the, you know, down scoping that problem, but not all candidates feel they have, and that's a slide I have about you know, advice for candidates, not all candidates feel they have that leverage, that they can negotiate, you know, uh, that seems like too much work, right? And it, it seems like it sounds bad, but it's actually a good thing. To me, that's a signal that the candidate understands time management and priorities, right? And that's an important thing. There is another question from one Go ahead. Uh, do you think there should be a single payment for home tasks? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about home tasks usually here in the, in the context of this slide. Yeah. But but again, it should be paid after a certain, if the task is big enough, right? If the task takes a day to do it, four hours or six hours, that's a reasonable amount of investment to ask the candidate to show that they're interested in the position. But if it takes a week, then it's too much. Why well, is it okay? Because if you would like to uh, not over time, maybe you will do it manually. I think if you do it two hours a day, it will take you a week. Sure, sure. I mean, reasonable time is like, I mean, if you can do it in a couple of hours to like 16 work hours, whatever oh, okay. that means, that, that's okay, right? It, it just, and again, I'm stressing the the main word that's underlined here is unreasonable, so right? No, no, it's it's a, it's a handshake between the, the interviewer or the company and the candidate. So if they are both agree that it's a reasonable amount of time, then it's reasonable. If they don't agree, then you know, then we have we're in this situation. Uh, okay. So another problem that we see is kind of the rock star interview, uh, and the idea here is that the can yeah the stallions yeah they're magnificent. Uh, the the candidate is judged against an unreasonable or unreasonably high bar here again i should have underlined maybe that but uh the, the idea here is that there's a couple of different problems related to this one is uh on the next slide uh 
10 years of experience with uh, one-year-old technology. That, that's kind of a, a popular thing to ask on LinkedIn, right? People who don't have the technical knowledge, you know, just inflate the numbers. Like, oh, you want that? Uh, you you told the HR like one year experience. They said, let's uh, let's you know raise the bar, right? The, the technology didn't exist back then. What are you talking about? Uh, so for entry level positions for juniors, and I see that I teach uh, some courses at university uh, from time to time, and I see that right now for students. When I was graduating and I was getting a job, oh, you actually know the language. You actually have some like, you know, pet projects that you did. You're amazing. Come on in. Right now they have like, you know, they are they have running production systems on their portfolio. And they're like, I don't think I qualify for that position, like for that internship. Like and that's there is an inflation of, of the expectation towards uh, the candidates. Obviously, it's easier nowadays to deploy to production than it was in, I, I'm not going to say the year, but uh, but back then, like, it was easier for us to demonstrate that we that we have the, yeah. Uh, well, from what I've seen so far, the interviews for entry-level positions are way harder for compared to interviews for senior uh, positions. Uh, I've been an interview uh, once before, when I've been applying for a senior position, and then she asked, just asked me, uh, what were you working for? And I said a couple of points. They said, okay, we'll hire you. Uh, you had an easy interview, and that's a reverse signal. As a, as a candidate, I would be suspicious about that. Yeah, but the, 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 question, the question here is uh, I've seen this in, a, 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 in too much companies, and maybe here we're doing it too. Uh, for entry level positions, we are far more concerned. Uh, because maybe because uh, you cannot be sure that this uh, this guy can be curable. You know, <laughs> they can start and they can uh, live here for one year or two years, and they can do. They can just know the language, but can't do anything for the job. So that's so about. Somebody goes in and he worked at some company that you know. Like you at least know that he can do some. You can check the references, but yeah. he left that company. How did he leave? Why did? Why is there? Why are they changing? Right? I mean, it's. I, I understand, and I agree to some extent. Here, I would say that the 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 trick is, what are you testing for in the interview? Are you testing that they have experience or that they have the right attitude? Right? Because these are two different things, and and they're not. They don't. You, uh, they're not like mutually dependent, right? You don't necessarily need the experience to have the attitude, and having the experience doesn't prove you still have the attitude. Yeah, right? when, you, when you're uh, when you're engaging for your first job, you always don't have any experience, and people can see that from the CV. So they uh, they make much harder interview to see how how you convert to the company, uh, and uh, I, I don't know. How is the unreasonably high bar here? So, uh, what is the bit of contact of unreasonability uh, when the candidate is so junior that it cannot know uh, if it's unreasonable or not? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a hard thing, and I think that's more about the kind of the where the company is in terms of culture and size and and expectations. Right, Facebook can have an unreasonably high bar towards even entry level positions because they can they have a thousand candidates and they are looking for three positions right so the churn uh, not the churn but the uh, population size that they have in their in their funnel is much better than if you have a startup and you know you're not sure whether you can even pay the salaries like 6 months down the road but you know you have a bar as high as facebook does right i mean so that's maybe more about the situation of the company and the kind of outlook of the people inside than specific, like, you know, kind of this is the set bar or something like that. Yeah, okay. That, that's something that I would like to discuss after the presentation. Sure, sure. Because, uh, I don't on the, on the side of the company and thought of the candidate, maybe I would like to discuss it also. 
I don't pretend to have all the answers. That's just kind of the, an amalgamation of all the experiences I've had over, I would not say a thousand interviews, but kind of that, that range. Uh, okay, so the other thing is during the interview, uh, and that relates to that magic trick problem that we talked about earlier. Uh, you don't need to remind the, the uh, candidate that they're not like Dean, uh, Jeff Dean or the Crockford. Do you know who, who this guy is, the Crockford? You're not JavaScript developers, guys. You're, this is BeerJS, you should know. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's the writer, uh, the author of the uh, JavaScript, the good parts book uh, and, and others. But anyway, yeah, very cool. And, uh, and then the other thing is that uh, I've heard, and th this is again a topic that we can discuss, and I've seen arguments both ways, and I've done it both ways. Uh, you have to, if you're reading uh, uh, the CV of a candidate before the interview, you have to be very cautious about it biasing you towards something, right? If you see a very rich CV with a lot of experience, you might kind of raise the bar in your head, like, oh, I expect this guy to literally know everything, right? And and so my judgment towards them is much stricter than if if I'm the candidate, if my if I left things out of the CV. Right. So now I have to think about what, what's enough in the CV to set enough expectations so I can jump over them. Right. So it becomes a different type of game. Right. But it, again, it's just about knowing your biases. When you go into the interview, I've seen uh, a guy that's done more than 5,000 interviews, I think much more than 5,000, who uh, who never read the CVs beforehand and they just tried to, after the interview, guess, like, you know, what type of positions the candidate was in. Like, that was the, if he could guess, then he got evidence out of the interview, right? Because he got enough predictive capability, right? That's the scientific method. Uh, yeah. Uh, that one already showed this one. And the worst type of interview is the inconclusive interview. So if you are doing an, an interview and you come out of it as an interviewer and you come out of it and you don't know whether you want to hire the candidate or not, you failed complete, right? That's the worst possible outcome. And I've done that myself. And it's very easy for beginner interviewers to fall into that uh, thing where they're not sure. Like, I don't know. I don't have, I, you know, maybe, maybe they could do it, right? It, it's up to you when you're in that room to help the candidate convince you that they can do it, right? If they cannot do it, they'll convince you they cannot do it, right? But it's up to you to extract that evidence out of the candidate, right? If, you, if you're, like, trying to be too polite, right? There's also a, a kind of a balance here between being too polite and actually not getting what you want out of the thing. So if we're too polite and we just stare at each other like like that, we come out and well, he was very polite. We mentioned the weather in the beginning, and then nothing, right? And and that that doesn't work. So you have to make sure that you come out of that room with evidence, with a decision, or not with a decision necessarily, but with enough evidence that you can participate in the washing and you can contribute to that discussion at the end of the, of the process. Uh, and if you waste the company's time, the, the candidate's time, you know, they're not going to come back and say, well, can we do a second one? I mean, probably at some some parts it works like in some places it works but it's usually a bad sign uh, if that happens okay so uh that was kind of the, the part about uh the problematic types of interviews and maybe i should switch those but now we get into the process of the interviewing right how we structure the the pipeline basically the funnel of the interviews so Usually we start with screening, and screening is something that uh, in front loading interviews, and this is something that is usually applied when there is a lot of candidates in your pipeline, right? If you're getting one candidate a month, you don't need to screen them. You can basically 
going a face-to-face -face interview directly. You don't need to send them an automated thing, right? If you're getting a thousand candidates a day, you cannot interview them all. You need to screen, right? So it's again about applying it. I've seen companies that don't get any, I mean, we've been a company uh, that, that gets one candidate a month literally, and we spend more time on developing the screening test than we would have spent on interviewing the people directly, right? So, and, and you're not guaranteed because these screenings do not actually give you, a, never give you a positive signal. They don't tell you whether the candidate is actually gonna be fit in your company they only tell you when they're not going right so you're just negatively screening you're never positively screening you know, in, in this automated way uh, okay so one way to do it is automated tests so you, you send them something like hacker rank or something like that and they uh, fill it in uh, it could be code it could be just like ABC it doesn't matter. They solve that and great, you, you have a filter. And that filter should be the first line of defense and should filter out the, the weakest candidates. And as I said, it's not actually, doesn't provide any evidence about suitability, whether the candidate actually is suitable for the position. Uh, the homework assignments, we have already had a little bit of a discussion about it. Uh, it's a great tool uh, and it's a great if you actually take time to review the candidate's code. And as a candidate, it also shows a lot of the company's culture when you receive feedback on your kind of project in GitHub in the same way that people in the company do it towards each other, right? If I get a code review, I participate, not, I'm not only writing a code and giving evidence one way just giving some piece of code that i've written i'm also participating in the follow-up process of participating in a code review how well do i take criticism if somebody is trying to bully me and tell me something false during the uh during the code review do i kind of say yeah of course sorry i missed, made a mistake or i say no that's actually the way it should be done because i know that right and you stand your ground because you have like the facts on your side right that's a very good technique to measure the 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 personality of the candidate right whether they uh, always agree with authority or they can question and assert their technical ability right because you don't want something plus you. you don't want somebody that or maybe you do but usually you wouldn't want somebody that just is a yes man and, and does whatever you tell them, whether or not you're right or not, right? You hire people in order for them to, you know, give you ideas and help you fix your own misconceptions and problems. So if you so it should not be fully automated. Read the code, give feedback, make that a thing, right? Uh, you get an early insight into the craft, the way that people work. Do, are they linting, right? Uh, are they uh, applying some uh, some other tools to make like static code analysis? Uh, how are they presenting their deliverables? Are they, did they package it? Is it runnable in Docker? Uh, is Does it have documentation? Uh, you know how well how easy is it to run it you know all of these things are signals about how the candidate actually would do their job later on uh, and the other thing very important is whenever you give them a homework assignment i would underscope it so i would make it smaller and then kind of incentivize them to add something from themselves right to be creative to expand on the the problem that they're solving in some way my experience, when you see a candidate do something for homework assignment, you should expect them that they will uh, do it max what they did on in the interview. They're uh, usually uh, only the one after being kind of fired. Yeah, they, they try to present their best during the interview, but they cannot keep it uh, every day, eight hours a day. Uh, sometimes I don't know. I mean, I haven't had that. <laughs> that like I don't have the data. Uh, okay, so uh, then we come to the 
sure. Can we talk? Yeah. So we have to do system design interview, and and that's that's one of my favorite types of interviews. Uh, the idea here is that you ask the candidate a very open-ended question, like how would you build and deploy a social media system? Right? And here you're not looking for them to start writing code. They should just, you know, uh, and you have a script in the best scenario. You have a script about different possibilities that you present them, right? So you say, okay, uh, they start like I'll deploy it to Kubernetes and whatever. Uh, you have one week and you're working alone. Oh, okay, then I'll write it in PHP and I'll deploy it on like, you know, so whatever, like super posting, yeah. So, uh, how do they react to the changing requirements, to the changing environment? How do they budget? Do they think about completeness? Do they budget their time? Uh, proactively thinking about error handling, right? I'm expecting, especially in senior candidates, when I interview, the difference between the interview is basically nothing uh, between junior, not junior, but mid-level and senior. The difference is not in the way I conduct the interview, is what I expect the candidate to mention and to elaborate on proactively. Like if the candidate says, here we have to think about failure modes, right? How do how does the system fail? How are we going to handle that? How are we going to scale? Like if they start thinking about these things proactively, to me, that's a good signal. I'm, I'm going to probe them, probe them further, but to me, mentioning aspects of the, of the solution proactively is a good sign like going into the details like here let's say we're doing a social media site right how would you do notifications how what what if one uh user becomes very popular like goes viral how how do you handle that what what necessity what changes to the system that, that does that necessity Right, so you can probe about how they think about building uh, software systems. We're long past the day where you're hiring somebody to write inside the monolith on that one model view controller triple that you know they're like just working on that. Usually, people are nowadays building multiple or working contributing towards multiple services across a complex infrastructure of interconnected parts, right, moving parts. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, how do you that are HR made? Meaning of truths and pet product being best as production products. I mean, as I said, you might just ignore CVs in general, and and that would be a good thing. If you read CVs beforehand, I suggest just picking a couple of things that you're interested in and not you don't want to weave them in if, if you're doing so that that goes into another topic and that's interview structure right i've seen you know we'll have a three-hour interview and we'll do a bit of this now and a bit of that that's awful right for the candidate they don't have structure you have to have manage sessions with breaks between them right if we do uh 45 minutes of system design take a 15 minute break and you uh, you warn the candidate. Next, you're going to uh, depth of expertise uh, type of interview. Uh, we're going to talk about that next. Uh, and then you send them off to another person, and they'll have a different. And you can warn the other person during that time. Hey, that seemed like a weird thing. Can you probe him on that? Right. So it can have continuation there, and and that gives you structure. Uh, so about the CVs, I would say ignore them or you know question the candidate like but in a polite way in a way that hey that seems like an interesting thing can you elaborate right so uh, when i come in a bit to to depth of expertise that's where previous experiences yeah go ahead. but before the interview maybe the uh, recruiter uh, sees the cd sees his project and gives back questions before of course uh, yes yes that, that's that's uh that's part of the screening as well yeah that's even part of the engagement kind of portion of, of uh, the process where the recruiter on their own especially a very knowledgeable recruiter can kind of screen out a lot of candidates before they even hit your automated test um okay so yeah so system design helps you understand whether the candidate not only can build a system or knows how to build a system but whether they can 
be in a team lead position, right? Whether they can manage a team, they do they know how to budget people uh, and resources and think about like a, a larger kind of organizational level. Uh, the caveat here is that this type of interview only <laughs> confirms that somebody knows how to build a system. It doesn't confirm that they actually can build it, right? So <laughs> they they know in theory. In theory, I know how to get to the moon. I just need to jump real high, right? And I'll be there. But in practice, I haven't done it yet. Uh, so, so that's a, a thing to, you know, you get out of the interview. This guy's going to solve all our problems. He knows how to do it, right? And then you hire them and they're like, yeah, we'll need like 15 architects here to work under me so they can implement my grand vision, right? That's useless. Uh, yeah. Okay. So in, in this type of interviews, Obviously, whiteboarding is a great tool where you allow the candidate to just, you know, draw system designs uh, like diagrams. You can even talk about the types of diagrams they're using, and that's more information, more evidence for you. Okay, uh, the depth of expertise, and here's where questioning the CV comes in, right? So we discussed previous projects. Uh, the idea of this kind of format is to discover the limits of the candidate's knowledge and experience. So the idea is like if they're like, okay, push them, push them further and further. Like, okay, but how does that work? How does that work? Like, you know, what? How does? What, why does the register of the processor like you know does that? When, when is it cached? Right? You know, you can go down and up in the level of abstraction, trying to just feel out where the where the candidate says, I don't know. Do they try to lie? Do they try to bullshit? Do they confess like, you know, do they know their own limitations, right? Uh, you encourage the candidate to do self-evaluation on the projects. Could you have done it better? Why did the project, would you consider it a success or a failure? Do you have any failures that you want to share, right? I mean, because that's a, it's easy to say, oh, everything on my CV is a success, right? But that's not true, obviously. I mean, nobody like if we if it was like that, we'd all be billionaires and like you know that we never made a mistake in our career. That's that's bullshit. So obviously, you know, if the candidate here is it's that you're judging their not judging but collecting evidence about their attitude, uh, the way they think about leadership, whether they can do it or at least accept it. In, in a specific way, and how they judge impact, right? Uh, do they measure? Yeah, I've had that conversation with a guy uh, at one point where, like, well, do you are you happy with the work you're doing? And he said, Yeah, I wrote like uh, a million lines of code in that period. And did we deploy anything? Well, no, the users were stupid. And I'm like, Yep, you're great, uh, very senior. Um, so th th that idea of like, how do we measure our successes, right? You can, and, and talking about previous projects and talking about experience, that all can be done in this sort of session. But again, it's not like a lot of people do this, but they don't focus, right? A lot of times you, you go to a company, they do a little bit of that, a little bit of this. When you have a focused interview, where you, when you prepare in advance your kind of ideas, what are we what are we <laughs> focusing on? What evidence are we trying to collect in this specific session? Then when you come to the end, when you come to uh, the bar laser and the wash up, I'll skip for, I'm just going to talk about the wash up. When you come to the wash up, then it's easy to actually take a decision because you all of you've collected different types of evidence. Some of it overlaps, some of it like clashes, and and then you have that aggregation, and you're talking about you know, you know whether we actually want to hire this person or not, right? Do you think it's a good idea to uh, invite some? Um person from a company that's not involved with the candidate, maybe more junior than them. Mike, I don't, I mean, I haven't, we haven't done that. As far as I know, I haven't been on a wash up where somebody is completely clueless, but maybe, maybe it could work. I mean, it, it's, it's okay. And I don't have slides about this, but I'll talk about it a little bit afterwards uh, about how you actually train interviewers. 
uh, and that may be part of that process. Right? Uh, we call that shadow, right? If you when you shadow, you can shadow. You usually shadow uh, throughout the cycle, right? So you start with uh, shadowing means like I just go in the interview and I just listen and I take notes both about the candidate and about the interviewer, right? So I kind of am trying to do you know to think about both sides of the of the equation and then you start after a couple of times shadowing you start reverse shadowing which is you lead the interview but you have an experienced person with you just you know monitoring your performance helping a little bit sometimes even on slack you know i've just had that dude cut him off he's like rambling now like just you have to cut him off because he's not helping himself right now he's just talking and you're not getting anything out of it and i'm too polite to cut him off so that was very good advice to say thanks that's great let's move on right and, it, and it's fine in the interview it's fine for the interviewer to say you know let's move to another topic right that's perfectly all right. uh so yeah and then after reverse shadowing you you're pretty much ready to start interviewing on your own and then getting somebody to shadow you and the cycle continues. Um, yeah, so the, the wash up is where people talk about the candidate and make that decision. Before the wash up, uh, there is sometimes that idea, usually in larger companies, that idea of a bar raiser. And the idea I think originated at Amazon uh, and kind of very fuzzily formulated, it's uh, the candidate should be uh, better than 50% of the pe people in that position right now, right? So you want to get people that are better. If you do that, right, you sh you're shifting the mean. If you imagine a distribution of skill like in the population, you're shifting where the mean is, right? You're making the, can oh, every candidate is better. Now we're climbing that. Of course, obviously, you cannot do 100% like skill, but that's a different question. But it, that's why it's fuzzy, right? But that's the idea that it's a short interview. It's a way, and it happens after all the other interviews, and it's done by a very senior person who has a, a large view over a big part of the organization. Let's say a, a tribe lead or uh you know some vp of engineering or something like that like depending on the type of you know the type of organization you're having like department head something like that so <laughs> they go in or if it's a small company maybe the cto goes into like you know a final session with candidates right and sometimes you have very strong red flags at, at one point of the interview process and if you find some very very strong red flags you don't need to continue that right i mean you can drop a candidate after the first interview and say okay we have enough evidence that this candidate shouldn't continue on with the process you don't need to run the, the candidate through the entire pipeline and, and waste the cto's time just you know to go through the motions uh okay that's it uh, some advice for candidates uh, basically, ask clarifying questions, and these are all obvious, right? So, that's mm -hmm. uh, explain your thought process, demonstrate contextual knowledge. So, if you're talking about something, you know, bring up that, ah, that sounds, you know, or that's similar to that thing. I have a little bit of experience with that semi related thing, right? You know, just contextualize, right? That you know more than what's asked, right? That you have a, a broader understanding and appreciation of the subject matter, right? You know, if you've studied computer science at university, you didn't study like, you know, how to bang the, the code with a hammer. You studied how, you know, the, the art of information. Basically. So have that attitude, like display that if you have it. Uh, allow yourself to politely disagree, something that I've touched on. Right. If you sometimes that's very important. That's where uh, people are. I mean, the interviewers are testing you whether you can disagree or not. Right. If you cannot disagree, that's a bad sign. You have to make sure that if you're right, you're right, and you disagree in a polite way. They might even try to provoke, you, right, just to see how you react. Uh, and don't hide your personality. Right. I mean. That for me personally, uh, I've learned that the hard way. First interviews, you go like you're very stiff, 
right? And you're like, blank. Um, hello, I'm Mr. Blank. Uh, I will do whatever you say. I don't care whatever the company says it's right, right? No, go in, like juggle a little bit. I mean, I do that, like, you know, uh, show that you're a person and that you can contribute to the culture of the company and the team and you can, you have a, you, you're a real person, right? No, don't show just that you can do like the camera and the code. Uh, okay, so just to reiterate real quick, good interviewers are like detectives, they are looking for evidence. Good candidates are like sloppy criminals, they leave a lot of evidence behind. And as an interviewer, you're not a judge, you're just collecting the evidence. That's it. Okay, uh, I wish to thank you for, for this great presentation. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on. It's a, it's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, he's now hiding his personality. I was wondering about those mixed interviews where, where, you, where you choose to, to use several of your employees for, for those interviews and you can uh, to what extent can you can you go with this? So like there was a question about can you can you choose showing someone who's more junior than the, the hiring or well can you tell us more about this yeah. this, this thing? Yeah. I mean there's two questions like uh, there is the question of having Many people in the room and how the candidate feels about just you know facing a group instead of yeah and then there's the question about if there are a couple of people are they asking different questions and are they asking them in a way that prevents the candidate from continuing their line of thought are they forcing the candidate to context switch I would say if you if you kind of give a warning in advance. To the candidate, hey, by the way, don't worry. We're gonna be like this, 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 this guy in the interview. Uh, that's fine. That's I mean, the, if the candidate has a problem, they'll say, hey, I'm you know shy or something, and you say, don't worry about it. You have to work in a team anyway, right? I mean, if you're hiring somebody to work in the basement, like John, the guy that with the ponytail, like you know, you have one box here walk a kilometer in the data center, another box here. Like, you know, this guy probably, you know, you, but but usually you would work in a team anyway, so having a group shouldn't be that big of a deal, but you can warn in advance. One time I remember I went into an interview and I was waiting in the lobby of the company and they say, uh, you know, just wait five more minutes, uh, they're gathering. And I'm like, Okay, that sounds like ominous. And I go in and it's like seven people and they're like, uh, they start introducing themselves. I'm uh, the lead of this team. I'm the lead of this team. I'm the lead of this team. I'm the lead of this team. And I'm like, okay, that's uh, an expensive room right <laughs> here. Like, you know, that would be an expensive hour for this company. Uh, and then that's, but that's fine, right? It's, uh, if it's a useful, um, if you have a, a plan, for what the interview would be like, then that's fine. In that specific interview, they were pitching me their projects. It wasn't, the interview wasn't, can I do the job? It was, which team would I feel best to join, right? So that 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 worked perfectly. And I was like very pumped after that because they gave me choices as well as, you know, context. Uh, but if you go in like four people and like everybody's like half, asleep crowd there and you're like uh, somebody's asking a question the candidate's starting thinking you can see that you have a connection you're getting some information and somebody's like but what about that thing and they break the entire thing right and that that's yeah. awful yeah it shatters. so if you manage the context if you plan mm -hmm. if you have a good kind of dynamic dynamic within the group of interviewers it's perfectly fine to have more people interview but it's hard, maybe harder. Yeah, the question from the YouTube uh, time machine. So, what would it mean if a job interview is too easy? <clears throat> Sorry, too easy. It's too easy. Um, well, it can mean a lot of things. I mean, sometimes 
life is easy. Sometimes it's hard. It's not every day you break your leg and it's not every day you find like a bag of money. So I mean, you have to, I would question it. I would try to, as a candidate, I would try to, um, to find out why that happened, whether it's because the bar at the company is low, whether it's because they have ev enough evidence from other places, let's say the work, the homework assignment. Like if you know somebody is good, if you've collected enough evidence and the whole team is convinced, you don't need to grill them like for five hours, right? You can you can have a quick session just confirming certain things, right? You can, you know, it, and then it could be easy. But if there was no homework, as you said, like you go in, you've never seen the people and they're like, you work there, you're good to go, right? I mean, that that that's maybe a bad signal about what other people would there be in that team, right? How, if, if they didn't, like you're perfect, obviously. Okay. I'm the best, yeah, I'm the best, obviously, but they always hired the best, right? So, like, are the rest is the best as me as I am, right? So, it, it becomes that you have to question if they have a low bar, whether you you want to even go there because it might be like uh, in Bulgarian, <laughs> like just people collected random people, like that again from Silicon Valley, like you know, Gilfoyle. You know, gather the team of like the water lady, uh, the cleaner, and there's big heads. Yeah, yeah, and there's big heads. So yeah. Uh, 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 as here being the relatively small company, we doesn't have uh, lead of that, lead of that, lead of that. But still trying to do that with uh, more people making an interview. Getting their own uh, mindset and making the final decision easy for making the wash up. Uh, but how do you train that people to be on the same page and not doing that uh, in the middle of the interview? Let's do it that way. How, how do you achieve that? It's hard. It's hard. It, uh, it's, uh, you, not everybody should, like, I mean, first you find people that want to do interviews, then you actually explain them what doing interviews means, right? And you kind of should have a, a kind of training session. I don't know how long I've participated in a bunch of different kind of, uh, just uh, we, we ran through scenarios, interviewing each other. Like I think it was a two day workshop uh, with kind of very professional <laughs> items, right? I mean, some people from the company, but they, had a bunch of experience and they prepared like these yeah. structures yeah these structures that right now i'm telling you about them they're not the only possible structures obviously and you're free to invent your own but that invention costs effort and you know uh trial and error as well so so i mean you occasionally even from the best interview kind of team you get some flukes where the interview didn't go well because it's a it's a personal thing it's like theater you know it's some sometimes you go on stage or you go you see, you see the, the 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 guy and he's like he's a good actor usually but this time he was like you know wasn't doing it. so there is this it's a performance so yeah there's always something kind of special, like a special sauce to it. And about easy interviews, if you are the company, then you have to also question yourself, like to go back to that question. If you, as a company, like you, the camp goes out after like uh, 20 minutes and like they're like, I nailed it so hard. Like you have to see whether you need to adjust something, like whether the question was leaked, right? Let's say, uh, they've done that like you you have these situations where i go to a i went to a system design problem interview and they asked me and i said i've done this one are you sure you want to you don't want to give me another one because i've done that specific one before i've right. had time well, to think I, about, I it. about that. well because uh, uh, the three interviews with the same same problem yeah. with a stake where you have to find some bracket and you can Find if the brackets are balanced, and this is very popular. Another very popular. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you 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 only need to use to find it a good job. You're not going just to find an arbitrary job. Yeah, yeah but if you have solved the problem yesterday, then they ask you the same question yeah. that the other company asked you, then this is some it's, it's, that, there's some for wrong. if it's if it's uh if it's the the direct problem, I mean here here I specifically said system design interview where you're asked how would you build an X type of system, right? Uh, if it's a specific problem like, you know, the one with the array and you have to find the unique number if all the others are duplicates, then, you know, you just give them the, the optimal answer that you memorize and that's fine. But the, the for me, it's a bad signal as a candidate that they, they even ask me that sort of question as a senior, let's say, if I'm applying for a senior role, right? That's not... That's not the type of question yeah, I'd expect. Senior, you expected to know how to design said system. It was like if you ask me how to design a CMS for a forum or a database, like. Uh, on, on, uh, but a system design interview is based mainly on probability. Uh, you know, how this system is performed in production, how we do it in a uh, restricted amount of time and money and team. Uh, it's not about, uh, I will do a database, I will do a framework that uh, makes queries, and then I will just put some JSONs to the front end. And maybe if I'm a front end guy, I will just consume the JSONs and turn it some tables. You know, it's not. Uh, you're hired. <laughs> you're hired. It's, it's not how, uh, what you see from the candidate when you uh, ask them, uh, sign me a CMS system. If you want them to think about the usability, scalability, uh, mainly performance and skill uh, and uh, you can you know, focus it in different you know, ways. Uh, CMS system, uh, there is some cash uh, uh, elsewhere, and if you know that point from an uh, interview before that, uh, it, it mm -hmm. might be quite a practical experience. Uh, I also want to add uh, about the interview was too easy. It's a perception which is subjected by the personality, which means that he may totally felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. You can so, come out of the interview thinking it was very easy, and the other side is like this. Now. <laughs> so it's very. Specific that's a that's a very good observation. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? I was wondering, for example, if there is a company that makes profit only by candidates, you know, they, <laughs> they do it so fast, and he says, maybe, but it's not actually possible. Uh, in, in, in now, uh, we're working side by side with every last question. Uh, it was a part from our uh, list of the industry forum. Uh, and uh, maybe he best knows that uh, even if you have uh, three or four or six months of internship and you are assigned to project, this project is not even possible to be around on the green button. Uh, and what's that about being built to external plans? But there is a best possible. <laughs> can you the, the, the hiring process? So, can you make profit by, can you have a company that only does that? <laughs> you don't make software, you don't do shit, you just, <laughs> you just, uh, you just uh, make the interviews. The is this possible? The yes. hiring process is very uh, related to the culture of the company. If you want to hire the people, uh, to hire people who will relate to the culture of the company and to keep it the culture, you should hire it by yourself. You yeah. cannot outsource it just that's, because they will hire people who that they like, like, not you. But you can definitely have a company uh, that a company consults. That consults <laughs> an interview. Like if you know, I can I can charge money for you know. You guys decide you want me to help you build your interviewing thing. We can have a. I can get some money out of that potentially. Right. I don't think I will, but the it, it's it, it's a possibility. Definitely, it's, it's a rich space, and there is knowledge to be shared. And I'm happy to kind of share my little bit of experience with that. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a little bit of a note. There's a lot of time doing sometimes just making interviews for other companies and they pay for them. It's similar. No, it's it's the same. Yeah, there's also.
But they, they are they are they are making the culture to keep the view. I don't do that. So I, I can say my concerns because they do the final say. So I you have a candidate candidate. If I had that power, well I would be the happiest man in the world. <laughs> do I want to ask something? But I want to say you no know, springs to this equipment. They are actually like screening candidates for the companies and depending on their feedback to the companies. Yeah, that's uh, that you can do. Hacker Rank does this, right? If you do, if if you go on Hacker Rank and you complete some things, they you can use that as initial input towards I like positions. Such an interview, and when I found out that I'm not being interviewed by the company, it was the best time. Yeah, like, if you weren't told in advance, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe there is a good sign if uh, either the company uses the external provider as theirs and say this is our team and they are okay with that, or they say this external team you cannot. Just but then the question is, why wouldn't you just outsource the work? I mean, if you're outsourcing the hiring, outsource the office space. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and... Outsource the accounting. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. The customer engagement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you know, for the candidates, it's not uh, nice. Like, for me, when I found out that I'm not interviewed by the principal. Uh, he pointed in the presentation that it's good to be new during the interviews. It's better to be directly with the company which we are going to work for, just because if it's not way of behaving yourself, after three or maybe six months, you will say, I'm going to quit this company just because it sucks. Actually, the company doesn't suck, but you don't quit to the company. So it's better to see the people directly from the company, not to use outsourcing services to hire you. Uh, for the yeah. But if it's a tool and you go in and you know that you're using this tool specifically and that you're taking one interview and that would become the you fan out, right? It would become the input for like you actually applying to 10 companies but skipping like the first step because you've passed that specific interview and all the companies agree that a good screening, right? Companies can share that screening and then enter you in their interview process based on that screening. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, just, uh, but you have to know that you're doing the shared screening and you're not like lied to that you're just applying for one company. And that's what you Like when you said sharing, I, I was wondering for you about uh, uh, how companies share information about candidates. Do they do the share? Not, not, not as much. I found that it's it's a market opportunity, and there are a bunch of companies that do this. You, when you wanna uh, wanna set the, the salaries, right? The salary bands. When you're hiring, as a company, you have some salary bands. How much are you willing to pay a candidate? And usually, that's adjusted through market data, right? You adjust that based on some data. And usually what I've seen is that there are companies that sign an NDA with with a lot of other companies. They, so they profile you and they, they send your profile. If one company has rejected you, maybe some other company has, uh, is allowed to see this, uh, your process, your interview process. Maybe. No, no, I was thinking more about, specifically about salary ranges that you know, these like a company, a consulting company collects a lot of information from different companies and then gives like a salary range for each of the companies, like outputs like a number. But uh, they don't share the personal No, they don't. They don't. Yeah. And it's like GDPR it, stuff. It sounds possible. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, but you, you can put references on some people if you're asking. Or and found it that they work with it. It's uh, it's not something common to just someone goes interview with you and it's not for the interview, you check them and put on uh, Facebook your experience with that candidate doing the name and something and that, that that's not good. That I've seen anyone do I've seen the, the thing that happened when uh, the uh, when Skyscanner closed their office here. Uh and they closed a bunch of offices and they laid out uh, laid out a bunch of people because of uh, Corona and travel. And um, the thing that happened is that on LinkedIn, they advertised 
the people going out saying they hey, have also yeah. made the website with, with the profiles of the people with the links of their uh, linkedin most profiles. Of them, many, most of them many many is when when a positive feedback is yeah. not usually not not not, not in, yes usually but there are some exceptions uh there is some uh, some companies that do this screening. Uh, big companies use that. Uh, when someone uh, applies for a job in a big company, they use a lot of also that work for company that screen that, that, and they just start screening uh, to previous companies and uh, let you uh, some uh, reference. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, it's a database. <laughs> they, uh, then put their reference in their database. And so after they are asking for another company, company they, had, they say, we have this, do you want us to bring it? Yeah. The problem with the database of that sort is that first it's hard to get context out of it, right? How do you know, like, whether the boss, like, hated that guy and just wrote in the database some nasty shit that wasn't true. Uh, the other thing is that a negative data point is much heavier than a positive data. Human psychology. When you when you hear something bad about somebody, we have timeline. Yes. 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 So probably if your group initial black skin, and after that, stop the camera. Stop. The camera. <laughs> group us in person will really be jealous. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Then we miss the discussion. Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, we understand me initial for this great presentation, okay. and we're going to. Be here.